Danny Coleman, welcome to the Rocky Mountain Writer Podcast. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Great to have you on. We are here to talk about and promote and get folks excited for putting in a workshop proposal for Colorado Gold, which will be in September, of course. And you are co-chair of the workshop, what is it, the workshop committee? Workshop selection committee. Yeah, workshop selection committee, along with Stephanie Reisner, correct? Yes. Yeah. Great to have you on. We're going to talk about the process and the fact that the window closes on February 29th. Is it, or is there, is there actually a February 29th this year? Yes. It's leap year. <laughs> leap year. All right. Um, one extra day to submit your proposal. One extra day. That's great. Um, so we want to talk about all that, but let's just quickly um, get you introduced to the community for folks who don't know you. Can you give us a little background on yourself um, and also just tell us a little, about, a little bit about your writing? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so I work in climate science at NCAR in Boulder, and I got, I've been writing since I was, you know, five years old. I'm one of those people, but once, but I chose to go the math and science route in college and then at some point I was re reading a blurb in Wired Magazine saying that we needed more fiction about climate issues, that that's how people would really understand what was going on with the climate rather than, you know, reading the facts, they should have the experience of it. And I thought, oh, well, here I'm writing. At the time I was writing short stories and I was working in climate. So I thought, I guess I'm really well suited to write that. So I managed, I had a character in mind that I hadn't really come up with for a story and I set her in a post-apocalyptic Colorado world and then pretty soon realized this isn't a short story. And so that became my first novel. Um, Which was titled? Um, so it's titled Winter Yield. Um, it's not published. It's uh, it was I, I still have hopes for it, but it was basically it took me a long time to finish and to polish and rewrite. I think I probably rewrote it completely three times by the end of it. And then right when I was ready to um to start querying it was right during COVID I was writing something much more amusing and I sort of neglected it at the time after hearing from a few people they didn't want depressing stories but it's still in the the unpublished backlist I guess I'd say yeah so the more amusing project what's 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 happening there yeah so uh, well that was another another project that hasn't gone anywhere I finished that I wrote I wrote a middle grade novel um uh, that was centered on sort of racial justice um, themes. And then by the time I, it got outdated rather quickly because of, of all the racial justice uh, activism that was going on during COVID. And I also realized that I wasn't, I didn't want to take the place. I didn't want to be a white woman taking a place, telling a white kid's story, taking a place on a bookshelf. So again, it's on the backlist. I think it could, it could be interesting at some point, but at this point, I'm not necessarily um, pursuing publishing. And again, by the time by the time I was querying that, I was writing. But then I started writing a, a true sci-fi, where my post-apocalyptic was set in the future, but it was very much women's women's fiction. And so, it always had. I felt like it it was always competing on uneven <laughs> sort of from a disadvantage because you know, I'd be in the, like the RMFW contest, it would final, it finaled twice in the contest, it, but it always had to be in the sci-fi um, category because it was set in the future, but then you're competing, you know, you're, you're looking at agents who are, who are uh, choosing something and they represent militaristic sci-fi or something. So yeah, hard to sell. Um, so now uh, my, well, my most completed project at this point is a novel set on the moon um, in the in the the next fifty years or so, and that's that's sort of in the third drafting stage. But again, I basically always end up writing women's fiction themes, so it's about a, a woman whose adult daughter goes to work on a mining colony in the moon and dies there under suspicious circumstances. So. Wow, have you seen For All Mankind? I have not. I should write okay. that on my list. Well, right it's speculative fiction set of, set in the of sort of alternate universe because it's not in the future necessarily, but mm. it's about a very female driven um, space program uh, and around women who go to the moon. And uh, I, we could get into a long talk about it. I think it was great in the first couple of seasons and really interesting. And then I think it personally just kind of 
jumped the rails a little bit. People say the fourth season came back, but uh, highly uh, produced at a very high level and uh, very engaging, a bit slow at times and kind of talky, but also tons of action. And um, then they went off to Mars, I think, in the third series, but uh, very female heavy and lots of parent, daughter, oh, nice. uh, father, daughter stuff. Yeah. So it might be right up your alley. Yeah, that sounds great. Most of the, yeah. I've read several of the moon novels and they tend to not hold my attention for very long, just the, the popular. Yeah. So. yeah, that's great. Wow. Uh, well, real quickly, before we get to the workshop stuff, what do you do at NCAR? Um, So I'm a computer programmer. I work on the atmosphere model. So whenever you hear like the models are projecting such and such, you know, I'm, I'm a tiny little part of that team. I'm a, I'm a support scientist, not not one of the people who are writing, you know, writing grants and coming up with the new ideas, but I'm sort of boots on the ground doing the programming. Wow. And are you a Colorado, Colorado person? Yes, I am. I am a third generation Colorado, I guess. So that's great. Wow. Where'd you go to college? Um, I went to CU. I, I grew up in Evergreen. And then I looked, looked, I did a college trip out east and a college trip out west and then decided that I didn't have enough money to go anywhere other than Colorado and the snow was better here anyway. So I stayed, mm -hmm. um, but I have, I have managed to, I've escaped for uh, sort of summers to years at a time to be abroad, but I haven't ever lived anywhere else in the U S. Gotcha. Wow. It's hard to leave Colorado. It's basically yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Well, Danny, this is great. Um, so when did you get connected with RMFW? And I know this is not your first year being the workshop um, chair. Yeah, so I it, it was actually through work, a total coincidence that I found RMFW, that we used to have a sort of a random staff profile that was published in the monthly newsletter at our work. And there's about a thousand people who work at NCAR. And they did a, a staff profile of a woman who mentioned in it that she... And she was somebody who I knew as just an acquaintance. And she mentioned in it that she was a fantasy writer and that she was going, that she loved this organization, RMFW. And so I looked it up. And as I recall that that year, I think the conference was just happening or had just happened. So I couldn't go to it then, but then I started following and then I went next year. And the conference really, it was my first writing conference ever. And it just totally blew my mind because I had been, you know, sitting by myself, sending, sending drafts to friends and having my husband read it, but, you know, just dealing with everything myself. And it was like being, being there at the conference and being surrounded by 400 other people who were just hanging on every word about some topic that I was totally interested in too, was, uh, it was, it was really amazing. So I've gone every year that I could since then. Um, about how long ago was that? So I think that was 2014. Uh-huh. So, so yeah. Well, I agree completely. My first conference was the same exact experience. Like, wow, this yeah. is uh, I, this is a real opportunity to really improve my skills and my knowledge and craft and everything. And I was just blown away by how much there was there to go soak up. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And also That's the great. people, I felt like you were learning all these things, but then you were also meeting people who were on all different stages in the publishing, you know, and publishing pathways. So there were the newbies and then there were people you was like, oh, if I learn this, then I could get to here. And there's, she's at this level and he's at this level. So it was. Yeah. Really yes. Yeah. Nice. And one thing I didn't appreciate at the time is all the work that goes into putting that kind of weekend together and all the huge number of workshops and activities who are all going on side by side and scheduling it. And I just kind of took it all in. And then finally, after a few years, it started to dawn on me the incredible amount of effort it would take to pull it all together, which brings us to the workshop selection committee. Cause I mean, there's a lot of other elements to the weekend, but clearly the workshops are the sort of the meat and potatoes of the whole thing in my mind, at least in addition to the banquets and the keynotes and the various other, you know, yeah. bar related activities and <laughs> things like that. Um, so give us an overview. Um, first of all, right now, the workshop selection process is beginning, at least in terms of just the portal is open for folks to go submit. Um, so give us a few reasons why if, if somebody's out there thinking about submitting something, um, why should they 
what what's the advantage of going through that process of submitting an idea? Um, well, it is, like you said, putting on the conference is a huge amount of work and it takes a lot of people teaching workshops and a lot. So some people are really established. They have classes. They know they can teach. Maybe they're even teaching MFA. It's not a it's not a question for them if they're going to teach. But I think there's a there's a lot of expertise in the membership that that um, isn't necessarily professional expertise, but people who have been doing this for a while they've they've learned things and then they can come in and they might have a perspective on some some aspect that they picked up along the way that is a unique and helpful for other people. And we're always looking for new and different takes on things. We don't want the conference. There's there's the, the sort of the bread and butter of what things that we need every year, but we always want different takes on those things and new voices give new perspectives on it. Yeah. It can be a little daunting to teach your first, you know, fiction writing workshop if you've never done it before. I know RMFW was the first time I ever stood up and presented something, but I found it to be really helpful to help me organize my own thoughts about my own process. And there, you're right, there might be just one little tiny aspect. You don't have to understand every bit of the publishing world landscape. There might be just something that you have a specific point of view about the writing process that you can bring and present. Yeah. Or it, it even, it doesn't, and it, it doesn't have to be something unique that you've come up with. We, we routinely have people who present on say, save the cat, which is not their own material, you know, or right. I did, I, I was reading the um, Dwight Swain book. Um, sure. Can't remember the name of it right now, but I'm sure you can put it in the show notes, right? It's yeah, uh, te techniques of the selling writer yeah, or something like that. Yeah, that sounds good. And I was reading yeah. that, and there was his scene sequel cycle was to me oh. was really mind blowing on oh, just a way to think about things that I hadn't seen in all the other writing books. And so I ended up studying it a lot. And then that was the first class that I taught because at some point I was like, nobody's talking about this. I haven't heard it at the conference, and it's it was really useful to me. And so I put it together. And then you're right, the work that you put in to developing a class, it's, I, I, you think, oh, I'm going to get, you know, a free conference by doing this class. But in the end, the amount of work that you put in, it, it, you really are putting in the work for, to get that benefit, yes. but it also benefits your writing. Yep. Yep. Really good point. Um, you are looking for a mix. We are, our MFW is looking for a mix of, we not, you know, new writers, experienced teachers. Um, and obviously diversity as much as possible as well yes. across all genres. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yep. How, how many roughly, do you have a rough idea of how many proposals you're likely to get this year? So in the last two years, we've gotten between 200 and 250. Um, and looking, look, looking for a total of how many do you think in the end? I think we end up, it, it depends a little, the numbers depend because if it's one hour versus two hours um, and the amount of programming isn't exactly, even the number of hours of programming isn't exactly the same every year. Um, but about, I think we ended up with about a hundred, maybe a little more than a hundred last right. year. So about a little, um, 40 to 50% will probably be be chosen somewhere yes. in there. Yeah. Some, and some, people, something yeah. like that. We wouldn't mind, you know, we wouldn't mind having 400 proposals to choose from just so yeah. and always, you know, always choose the cream of the crop. But it's uh, and then there are sometimes there are subjects sometimes that we, you know, we're really at the whim of just what people put in and what they decide to submit. And then so last year was the first year that I was the chair of the committee. And we had um, I think we had like two topics that when we looked through everything, we didn't have anything on. And so for those, we actually reached out to people that we knew could probably do something like that. But for the most part, we really just go with what people submit. And with the idea, and again, that what people are interested in teaching probably reflects a lot of what people are interested in hearing right at the moment. So like last year, we had four proposals on AI um, and that's what a right. lot of we're interested in it. Yeah. So walk us through the process. What happens after somebody submits a proposal? Uh, what's going to happen between now and when the determina determination is made about what is going to be included in the in the conference? Um, 
Okay, I'll try to answer that without getting too technical in the, <laughs> in the spreadsheeting <laughs> you, world. You, but, you've got a committee. You've got a committee. Yes. So we have a committee of 18 people right now. And as the as the workshops are submitted, um, they come in through our portal and then we are looking at them. And um, at this point, we have a not large enough committee that not everyone has to read everyone, but we try to have a minimum number of reading each proposal and giving some ratings. So the criteria that we're looking for is primarily the content and like how useful this is to writers. We're also, we are looking at teaching ability and experience. Um, and then we're looking for expertise as another dimension. Um, so somebody who has, you know, is a bestseller writer, like people are more likely to want to listen to them. It doesn't mean they're the best teacher. So somebody who's never published anything can be a great teacher and we're also looking for them. So yeah, we're looking along those different dimensions. And then, yeah, so the committee right now, as the portals, as the, as the proposals come in through the portal, we're rank, we're rating them just saying how, how do they stand on this? And then at the end of the month, once everything is in, then we can look in each category topic category we can look overall and essentially choose you know rank them within the category and then then depending on the programming needs that we have and the balance that we want between say writing craft or publishing um, marketing and uh, different things like that then we can then we'll we'll sort of choose which ones how far or how far down the list to go right right it is possible you'll put in an absolutely wonderful proposal, but it'll be very duplicative of another similar idea. And in some cases it might be just a flip of the coin. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Last year, last year we had a ton of proposals on mm -hmm. like the creat like creativity and more not necessarily generative, but just like as an artist, how do you maintain your creativity? Which I thought was probably due to the like returning from the COVID world and everybody mm -hmm. all the again, it was the interest of the crowd, which is all the writers saying, I wasn't able to work. What do I do now? So we had so many proposals come in and they all sounded good. But yeah, at some point we do have to choose you know, between one or another, and then then it comes down to a balance. Right. Can Can you walk us through the um, enticements? Uh, what if you do are accepted as a workshop presenter? Um, it's possible you might even be able to get a full comp on your conference fee, right? Yes. So this year, the compensation has changed a little bit this year. So this year. Uh, um, presenters can get compensated with a hundred percent discount on the conference. Um, if they, if they give three or more hours of workshop content, then they're in. If they don't have three, which is, it's a lot to teach. Um, you can teach two hours and then also volunteer to either be a panelist on somebody else's idea or to host a birds of a feather, um, session or to be a table host, the Friday dinner, or to do just individual critiques, um, conference attendees can sign up to get a blue pencil critique on a piece of work or a mentor session. Um, so that's sort of, it's sort of three hours overall that we're asking that you give during the conference. Right. So some people might not recognize what a, uh, or might not know what a birds of a feather session is or the blue pencil. Can you describe yeah. both of those? Sure. Okay. So birds of a feather, usually we have one hour during the conference for each genre when it's just an open uh, open room for everybody who writes that genre to come and discuss. Um, and in the past, it seems it's worked best if there's somebody who's a host who usually writes in that genre, um, who can be the host and help lead the discussion. Um, but it's really open to all writers like that. And then the blue pencil critique, somebody can bring, they bring a few pages. I don't know the exact number, but they bring a few pages um, just to a one-on-one -on -one session um, I don't remember if it's 15 or 30 minutes and the critiquer then reads through and gives, gives immediate feedback on those pages. So it's, it's like, it's immediate personalized, um, critique on, um, the, on, from an expert. And how does somebody sign up for either the birds of a feather or the blue pencil action or the mentoring thing? 
Um, so you mean for the presenters? Yes. Oh, yeah. So when you submit your proposal in the portal, you just select of the, of, of the add-ons that you're willing to contribute, you select which of those you're willing to do. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that's all in the little uh, online form the as you walk yeah, through exactly. it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is pretty darn slick, I must say. It's pretty darn and uh, easy to easy to walk through. Yeah. Well, I inherited it. That I inherited that from the people before me. So we just you yeah. know copy it and edit it every year, and everybody's we're always trying to to improve it or change things. So one thing this year, in case if there's people listening who hate having to come up with the all the references and all the stuff like that, that if you've presented for RMFW before, now you can skip the section on references. Um, so you just say what you've presented before, and then presumably we know we know you and what your, what your style is like. Whereas new presenters, we do want to have references um, and any experience that you have. Right, right. Well, I'm wondering, as you went to Colorado Gold last year, last uh, September, what was it like for you to walk around and see, you know, here's something that's all on paper, or at least it's online on a spreadsheet, turn into actual activity and, and a real conference? What was your experience like? Um, okay, so to be honest, I ended up missing most of the conference last year for a family funeral. And so oh, I sorry. didn't get to have that. I didn't, I didn't get to have that, but uh, uh, that's okay. So um, I'm sorry. Yeah, Sorry, I, think, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. I think did yeah. you didn't you miss last year too? I missed it too, and I yeah. yep i I got COVID at the last like two days before. I was yep. just crestfallen. What is the word? I was just yeah. couldn't believe it. But there was no it was no choice. I mean, it wasn't even a even a choice. Yeah, yeah. So having I was on the workshop select selection committee last right. year and had a pretty good flavor of what was kind of going to be coming and wanted to see a lot of it. And I had a couple of my own workshop proposals, I think were accepted, but I. Ended yeah, up no, I was really, yeah. I was really excited for yours. Was it like the live? Why was it? Hey, what well, was the your, power of now, the power the, of now. Yeah. That was yeah. the one that I was really excited for too. And then had, you had to cancel that. And so. So you're saying I should put back in. This I, year? Absolutely. We missed <laughs> last year. So yeah, All right. that one All back. right. I'll, Yes, I... I'll put it in. <laughs> yeah. And I had one on AI too, but I don't think I'll, I don't think I will go back to the, to doing that one. Um, Cause yeah. that, converse, that conversation has moved along. Well, I think there's still a lot. I'm expecting to get more about AI. So last year, if you recall, we had a bunch of proposals on AI and we decided to yep. put them all together as a panel. And then I believe you were going to be on the panel. So yeah, that's right. I was on a panel. That's right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah, because I thought it would be good. It was a controversial enough topic. We don't necessarily want to give an hour to this person to say their view and then in some other room to some other people an hour to give this room. I'd like, let's get all together and sort of make them engage with each other and with the yeah. arguments. So um I I I heard that it went well, but I haven't heard a lot of details. So it could it could be that this year just doing another panel, like what has happened and what's going on now? Because I know more and more people are using it. Um, in various ways for marketing and things like that. So right, how can it be right. useful and how can it be a threat? It's it's a very, very pertinent topic. And the lawsuit, like the lawsuits that are going on about copyright. Right, You're right, right. Yeah, and that's another thing um, that happens is workshop proposals come in, but the committee can kind of merge some ideas together and propose a panel back to some of those presenters and negotiate uh, kind of a different way of presenting something or diving into a topic. Yeah. 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 And we definitely, we always ask if people are willing to do, to do that. Um, and there are, yeah, there are sometimes with a workshop where we'll ask for someone to make sure that they're addressing something that we feel like is important to be, to be said in that, but um, yeah, the panel yeah. is one and just even submitting panels, actually, if you have an idea or if anybody has an idea for a panel, that counts as submitting a workshop. Um, and then that's part of, we get now being a panelist is one of those roles that other presenters can play um, as well as just, if you have people that you would recommend, they can be put on your panel. But if you just have an idea for something that you would love to see, um, by all means submit that, that's what, that's a workshop's um, proposal. Great, great. 
Very good. So what do you, as a writer, sort of as we wrap up here, as a writer, what are you, are you getting anything out of coordinating the selection committee along with Stephanie, of course, but are you getting anything out of it? Are you finding as you go? Um, well, so I guess reading, reading all of the aspects and the proposals, even the proposals that we don't um, except in the end, there's lots of interesting things and you just, you just get a lot more resources essentially. But I think for me, the main thing that I get out of being, um, on the committee is actually just the getting to know people in the organization better. I went, you know, I went to several conferences and I loved it. And then at some point, you know, the, the material is new every year, but you start to feel like, okay, I've, I've seen a lot of these sort of things. And then what's the point of the conference and the organization. And for me, I realized I like getting to know the people and seeing where they are getting the advice from them. Again, that just the networking, but having friends in the community, I think it, when you work with people, you get to be friends with them and it's I believe pretty valuable. And I mean, I'm assuming that it, that long-term, the long-term game of volunteering and anything like this is that those contacts are going to help everybody's career because we can all boost each other up. 1000%. That is the, that's where it's at. I, wouldn't have gone half as far without RMFW and just not even, not a question about that. So many friends, so many connections, so many little, you know, introductions, happenstance kinds of things. Uh, you can't even begin to count the networking benefits for sure. That's, that's where it's at. Yep. Very yeah. good. Yeah, at some point well, I thought it was too late. I thought I'm too busy. I've got my three kids at home and I have my job. And I thought I'm too busy to really take a big role. And then I realized at some point I was like, no, right now is exactly when I need to take a big role. Yep. Wow. Well, thanks for all your efforts. And as a work, workshop selection committee member again this year, I have to say the way that you put the spreadsheets together and uh, I mean, it's just amazing. It's so easy to work with and wow slick no. No, thanks. Yeah. No. yeah the unfortunate fact is that spreadsheeting is my happy place and i can distract yeah. myself and not end up writing while i'm in the <laughs> spreadsheet but i have i wish i knew a hundredth of what you know about spreadsheet work so yeah uh danny this has been wonderful as we wrap up i always like to give our guests a chance to promote a book or a writer um, just to pay it forward a little bit. So now is your chance. Okay. So I would like to recommend an N another NCAR employee or former employee, BJ Smith. He has uh, um, two novels right now. They're detective novels, which are not my genre at all, but they're just so well-written Midwestern detective novels. So BJ Smith, his first novel is Blood Solutions. And uh, I found just really, really well well written and fun to read. Um, and he's a local Colorado author. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. Well, Danny, good luck with the whole process this year. Can't wait to see what uh, Colorado Gold is um, going to be offering in September. And um, thanks a million for coming on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me and promoting it. Mm -hmm.